Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Angela. I'm, I'm on the committee of Build Good Writers, and my job here tonight is just to try and keep things going and to chair and introduce you to the three fantastic bloggers that we have talking to us tonight about their experiences, good, bad, indifferent, the what, the whys, and the hows of doing a food blog. Running down the table, we have Laura Washburn Hutton, who is also on the committee of the Guild. Um, her blog is Bad Vinaigrette, and to make sure I don't get this wrong, Laura, tell us what you won at the Portland Mason. Oh, online food writer. Online food writer at the Portland Mason last year, um, and you also blog the Borough Market. Marvellous. So Laura's going to be kicking us off. Then second down the table, we have Ed Smith, and anyone who's had anything to eat tonight, the marvellous charcuterie over there is from Cannon and Cannon, which is Ed's other hat when not doing lots and lots of food blogging uh, for your own rocket and squash. Yep. Um, and you also blog for Borough Market. Yep. And then at the end we have Samaya, who is blogging at My Camera in the Kitchen. And you have a book coming out in April. And I think it's very interesting to see how Samaya's blogging and the book will work together to kind of build a package of her food writing. So each of the guys are going to speak for about 10 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll probably save questions until the end. But if anybody has anything burning that they really want to ask, I think they might forget it if they have to wait until the end, then obviously please do stick your hand up or shout out or whatever. So we will pass over to Laura. Hi, okay. Um, right, let me get my notes out. So I think I started blogging, I was trying to remember this as I was coming tonight. That, it was either 2009 or 2010, um, and I just sort of did it, um, which is, I think, how most people do it. And um, it was just a little experiment in, in the form, and I, I try to remember how many actual blogs I've had. I mean, most of them are sort of buried, um, but certainly the blog I've got now was not my first. Um, I went through lots of stages, lots of experimentation. Um, and I think my motivation for doing it was frustration at not getting the kind of work I wanted to get. And I thought, well, it's because I need to get out there and sort of say who I am and tell the world and everything. And then, and then it sort of took its own it took its own life, really. I sort of thought, actually, this is fun. I can just sit here and say whatever I want. Nobody's reading except my mother anyway. And so you just kind of, just, you, you go on from there. And it's good because you learn. So you, you, you have to experiment, learn, make mistakes. And so I think that's probably the first thing I'd say about blogging is do not be afraid to make a fool out of yourself or make mistakes. And just, you kind of, you do actually just have to chuck yourself out there. Um, and I feel slightly, um, dwarfed by the people sitting next to me because I sort of feel like, well, I'm just a pretend blogger and they're actually real bloggers. Um, because the blog that I did that won the award was was the culmination of me sort of, you know, lack of a better word, farting around for about four years and just playing around with it. And then one day saying, I'm going to give it a year. I'm just going to give it a year and I'm just going to see what happened. And the thing that sparked me was one of our workshops, I can't remember which one it was, and Joan Ramsley was speaking, and she said, enter competitions. I, I, she wasn't speaking about blogs, but I kind of took that and applied it to myself. And I thought, right, I'm going to get my blog good enough to enter in, a comp, you know, in something. And so that, that's, that's all it was about, and I just had that as my goal. Um, yeah, and I did it, and it worked, and I think I just got really lucky. But I think part of the reason it worked was because I'd had those years of messing around behind me um, and doing it. But in terms of it helping me do what I wanted it to do in the beginning, which was maybe get more paid work, honestly, <laughs> it has gotten me some paid work. And it's gotten me a huge amount of satisfaction. Um, I mean, you know, winning that award was just like the best thing ever and really made it all worthwhile because sometimes it's just about confidence and how you feel about yourself and just recognition. I mean, you know, that's just worth everything. Um, but I think part of the reason why I haven't really been able to monetize my blog is because I'm not as dedicated as these two are. I think they're much better examples of how to like 
I wouldn't say blog professionally, but certainly much more career bloggers than I am, which doesn't mean you shouldn't dabble because you might get whatever you get out of it. it just, that thing of just lifting, you know, it's just that little bit that just lifts the rest of it. Um, so that said, I thought really what I would do is just sort of talk a little bit about how often you need to blog. Um, is that useful to people? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, the best way to decide, I suppose it's like anything you do, you know, if you're, if you're writing, you read a lot. If you want to blog, read a lot of other blogs. That's like the first thing you've got to do. See what everybody else is doing. See what you like, see what you don't like. Um, and that's really important. And then read blogs and see the kind of tones that people set. Um, there's all sorts of formulas about how often you do it, up to you really. I mean, you could blog every day, but God, you burn out. Um, once a week, I did once every other week, and that just about killed me. Um, it's, it was a lot of work. Um, and I suppose the next thing you need to think about is what you want to blog about. Um, obviously, we're all food writers here, so it's going to be a food blog of sorts, but you don't, it's not like a book where someone's commissioned you to do something really specific. This is kind of your chance to just do whatever you want. And maybe that's the hardest thing about blogging too, because it's such a blank canvas. You think, well, I, you know, what am I going to do, and why is anybody going to care? That may not really matter. Um, some of the best blogs I've ever seen are actually quite niche. Um, um, Sumaya is incredibly niche and very specific and very personal, and it really works because it's that thing too about just write about what you know. So. Um, you know, take your take your little corner of the world and your viewpoint, your perspective, and just and have a good time with it, and don't worry what anybody thinks. Um, and when I first started blogging, the first thing you have to you have to keep head around is that the actual blogging platforms themselves. I mean, it is a real technical leap. I'm a big fan of WordPress. Are you WordPress? Yeah. You both, yeah. Most people are WordPress. WordPress is wonderful. Not only is their platform wonderful, but they support their bloggers in the most delightful ways. I and mean, one of the first things that happened when I started blogging was I got this email one day from WordPress because they featured me on this thing of writing. And my stats just went through the roof. I was like, wow, people are reading this, you know, because they featured it. And, but, you know, they want to promote their bloggers. Um, and I just, I, I've loved them ever since. Um, but, you know, that's really good. And it's really easy to use. Nobody taught me how to set up my blog. I've done all four or five of them all by myself. Um, and is my blog up there? Yeah. So when I was doing my year-long thing of I'm going to really work hard on this and I'm just going to do it and see what happens, I had this fantasy that I was going to have this really beautifully designed blog. And there was this blog out there called Rocket and Squash that I really liked. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell you this. I thought, that's the benchmark. That's, I like, it's black and white. It's really, it's really beautiful. Can I tell you the secret? Is you have a brother who's a website designer. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I looked up like, yeah, I want mine to look, but you know, I don't have a brother who's a website designer. I just had me in WordPress. And so I couldn't quite get it going. So in the year that I was working on it, I spent a little bit of money and hired someone to do me a blog, taking it off WordPress. So that thing that you see there, if you look at the URL, my, it's, I think it says badvinaigrette.wordpress.com. That means I'm at WordPress. There is actually a badvinaigrette.com that I've never shown to the world because when I started designing it, and obviously I was on a budget and I was limited and there's all these things I could do, there was no way to get my little thingies done. I don't know if you can move it, Hattie. So you can see on the, where it says, the, where I've got my little Fort Newman Mason doodah. Yeah. Can you lift the screen up and scroll down? Yeah, and then keep going, and there's more little doodahs. I put all the other doodahs. Yeah, so Gilded Food Writers, Freshly Pressed, Mums, now I've got a few. I couldn't get those where I wanted them on my dot com, and I was getting really annoyed because I wasn't spending enough money on it. So I left it, and when I won the award at Fort Newman Mason, one of the tweets that came out was, it's so nice to see a, a this is a bog standard WordPress template, um, which means I spent no money on it, and I just did it myself, and they just said it was so refreshing just to see a plain old undesigned blog, I thought, right, well, I'm, I just, I, so I've never launched badmedigret.com, I thought that's, that was, that was part of my, thing was that I'm just this little WordPress blog and it 
I guess what it meant was it was a lot about the content, not how it looked. Which I suppose is the next thing I can get on to is there's this whole thing about, you know, to blog, not only do you have to be able to be technically savvy and a really good writer, you also have to take really good photographs. Well, I take really bad photographs. I have taken a photography class since and I'm getting better, but I still basically take really bad photographs and particularly bad photographs of food. Um, and, and that's a real problem in the visual world of blogging and social media in general. Images are really, really important. Um, so I decided to make it a thing that I don't do anything, I don't do any finished food, and I just, because I can't. And it didn't seem to stop me, but I mean, I have to say, it does look a lot better when you have images. Um, so, right, what are the my, I just feel like I'm just rambling here. Um, the other thing about that is that you can, sometimes when you get tired, the images are a good way to fill, to fill it out because it is quite a lot of hard work. Um, so in addition to kind of pacing yourself about how many times a week, a month, or whatever you blog, you, what kind of content, what do you want to say, you can have certain, and this is where it comes in looking at other people's blogs and seeing what they do. It doesn't always have to be words. You could just have a string of photographs, a one-line caption as you're entering that week, and it's so much easier. Um, I did a thing called the Bad Vinaigrette Gazette, which was, because mostly I just sit and read things on the internet all the time, I would save the links to them. Uh, find a Bad Vinaigrette Gazette, go down the side, under Fortnum and Mason, yeah. and just take one that says Gazette, and you'll do, you'll do. And so these are my lazy posts, because basically I'm always reading stuff on the internet, so I would just save them. And, and those are um, stock photos. I bought a set of 10 retro photos of people reading things. And, and, and so if you just scroll down, you can see I, I had politics, I, I had different categories, and I would just link to other people's writing. So twice a month I did that. So I didn't have to write anything, all I had to do was read and say, you know, and, and, and that's a really good way um, of doing a blog post without having to write. And I think blogging, a lot of it is how much work you can get away with not doing, because it is so much work. Um, so thinking about different kinds, yeah? Can you explain that again? You're linking to some... Okay, so if you look at it, so let's say the first one. If you click on food poverty, it takes you to the story in The Guardian. So what I would do is I would just sort of say what it was, highlight the link, and say where it came from. And so my categories were food politics, always recipes, and then I think I just sort of had really fun random things about food because as I kept reading, I kept finding there was all sorts of weird, wonderful so things. And are those links directly concerned with what you write about, or just? what you happen to find interesting at yeah. that particular moment. Yeah, so that's the thing about blog. It's you, it's whatever you want. So that was my thing. It's my, the whole point of the Gazette was I was, this is a word that people use a lot in blogging, curated. I curated my little, it's like my own little magazine of clippings. And I stole that idea from somebody else's blog. There's a lot of stealing that goes on and there's nothing wrong with it. So it's, it's just It's flattery. It's just a flavor of the month that's not particularly related to the topic that you have to no, because at that point in time, that was my blog entry, if you see what I mean. I didn't write, a, I, that's, that's, how, that's how I was lazy. Yeah, because otherwise you will spend, remember you're doing this and nobody's paying you. So while you're doing all this work, you're not doing work that's earning money. So make it easy on yourselves. Find shortcuts. Um, find dignified shortcuts. <laughs> so do you just think, do you ever ask permission before they? No, you don't need to because you're crediting it and you, you, it's just, you, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not stealing anything. I'm not saying it's mine. Yeah, you know, I'm just saying this is a really good article in Guardian, read it. Everybody does that. You can do that on Twitter, you can do it on Facebook, you can do it on your blog. Um, how can you just ask, how are you finding all these? Because presumably you're not Yes, I am, I'm sorry oh, to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, that was part of the thing, that was part of that year, was it was a year of, what am I doing? What do I want to do? What's going on? Uh, I, I, did, I spent a huge amount of money on it, which is money, time, psychological, um, which is why I'm not blogging anymore. 
it was my year to do it. I kind of, it did what I wanted it to do. It got me the <coughs> blog with for a market where they pay me. And we're not talking vast sums of money, but at least I write something and somebody pays me and it goes out to more than my 30 relatives and the 30 other people who saw it in WordPress and, you know, and all that stuff. So, it, it, yeah, it's, I think that's the thing just... Did you get the borough market um, blogging um, work through having your own blog? I got it because of the award. Because what? Because of the award. Okay. They noticed me, even though they knew me before and I was doing work for them. It never dawned on them to ask me to blog for them until I won the award. So it does, it, it helped. And, and if I was more ambitious and more pushy, I probably could have made a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. But I haven't. Because I, it was just my little challenge. I did it, I got there, and I'm moving on because there's other stuff I want to do. But the other stuff I want to do came directly out of the blog, which is an awareness of social media and online writing and lots of online stuff. And that's kind of the direction I'm going, but I'm moving away from the blog. Um, so, one more minute? Yep. Okay, so my last minute is, is I think some of the good advice I had while I was doing it that I took on board was content really matters. It doesn't really matter too much what your blog looks like. It matters what you say. Um, so even though the world is visual, and I'm not for one minute diminishing your, your beautiful <laughs> blog, and your and Sumaya's blog is beautiful as well. I mean, they're both professionally designed, and you can see and that just lifts the whole thing. But if it looks good and it doesn't read very well, it's just not going to go anywhere. So work on your content. I did a creative nonfiction writing class when I started out, and I have to, I have to say that that was huge. Um, gave me a lot of confidence, and I think it really helped my skills. Um, <coughs> the other thing that you have to do when you do a blog is you have to self-edit. So self-edit ruthlessly. Do not write and publish. Write, go to bed, read it again the next day walk the dog, read it again, go to bed again, wake up the next day, read it again. Don't publish it till you've reread it about 10 times at least. And don't publish it if you're angry at somebody. <laughs> Just, you know, let it breathe. Um, I mean, you can, the thing about your blog is you can always go in and change stuff, you can take stuff down. But, you know, it is, it, it's a reflection of you. So you, if you, nobody's editing you, you really, you have to spell things right. Your grammar has to be good. It has to try and think about how people are going to read it. Um, and that's hard. It's really hard to edit yourself. Um, think of it as an online portfolio as well. It's representing you. So how do you want to be represented in the world? Find a good title. Of my 15,000 blogs that I've had, this is the best title. And I think that had a lot to do with it. You know, it's like not only was I kind of in the right headspace too, and I taken that time out and really dedicated myself to it. It's a really good title. What, what is this? Bad vinaigrette. Oh, sorry. And in the designed version of my badvinaigrette.com that I don't show anybody, the bad is in italics, and then vinaigrette is not, and it just looks great. And, and anyway, but I didn't do it. it the, the title is good, and the way I found it was by reading other people's blogs and thinking about the kind of titles I liked, and I realized a lot of them came from quotes from books. So I started looking for quotes from books that I really liked, and that's how I found this. Um, but I think the title matters a lot. Um, yeah. What's so, the meaning of It's Nora Ephron. It's from Heartburn. Have you ever read any Nora Ephron? Oh God, read Nora Ephron if you haven't read her. For all food writers, she was amazing, absolutely an amazing writer. Um, married to Carl Bernstein, was it? She was of, of Bernstein and Woodward of Watergate fame. Got massive, big divorce. Heartburn. You've all seen the movie with Meg Ryan and whoever and whoever. It's a true story about her divorce from him. Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep, of course, played Nora Ephron. Anyway. But she was just, in, she's an amazing writer. And she was really, she was actually a food writer, even though she wasn't. There's so much food in her writing. Um, food was a big deal to her. And so in, there's this one line in the book Heartburn where she says something about, you know, I don't know why you wanted to leave me. I was, you know, my vinaigrette was so good. You know, I couldn't make a bad vinaigrette. Why would you want to lose that? You know, and I looked at her and I was like, yeah, bad. It just like, just leapt out at me. Bad vinaigrette was the title. But I did it by leafing through her books because I liked her. Um, yeah, so I think it's if you can, you have to find a hook to hang your blog on. So content, get a good title, be yourself, self-edit. Yeah, and take pictures. And make it look much more like theirs than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I have one last question. Yes. Um, I've 
Yeah. It does make sense. I think everybody's confused. And so if you put it out there, somebody, it will resonate with somebody if it resonates for you. I mean, if you're truthful about it. And experiment. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Um, when I did the creative nonfiction course, we were only allowed to write, a lot of times we, the, there were word limits. And boy, was that hard. And boy, is that a good exercise. 750? I would, I'm just chucking that one out there. Try it. You might find that you need 850. All right, fine. But you know, start somewhere and then... I don't know. I mean, there's things called long reads. Um, and they go on and on and on and on. But you know, you do have to be like as good as Nora Ephron to get away with that. <laughs> yeah. You done? Yeah. That was brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Laura. You just push it up. Is that working? Thanks. So yeah, so that's my log and just a little bit about it, just the story behind it and why I started it. Um, I started blogging about, well, I think 2010 or something like that. I'm allowed to go back to my old post. And it was really, really rubbish. It was so bad. Um, it was <laughs> really quite basic. In, I started in WordPress as well. And it all started from um, missing home cooking. That is really just behind it. And trying to pin down my mom's recipes, which was like pulling teeth because she couldn't ever tell me a recipe properly. So every time she'd say something, I'd literally just take it from her, put it down. And I thought, you know what? Why don't I just start writing it somewhere where people can get it? And um, that's where it just started from. And my, my real feelings behind it was um, I had a mission, and my mission was really simple. It was that I wanted people to know about the cuisine of my country, which is Pakistan. Um, I had moved um, to the UK um, a couple of years before that, which was about 10 years ago, and, um, and I realized that nobody knew anything about the cuisine that I grew up with, and I wanted people to sort of realize that this really positive culture, much opposed to the negativity that you normally hear, and I wanted them to know about the culture, the food, the people, and how um, much of a passion it is for us. And I thought that getting my old recipes from my family and putting them down in a blog um, might be a fun way of getting people out there to read it. So really that was my motivation to start blogging. So I had this mission, which started it off. Um, I started with a very rough platform of WordPress. I had no idea how to blog, I didn't know anything about it. I just started putting words down and it looked really bad, really bad photographs of food. Um, literally like overexposed orange photographs and that like. Um, and slowly I, I sort of started to realize that people actually started to read what I wrote and all my posts were quite personal so I would just, I loved writing, I always loved writing so I just sort of put down stories about growing up and memories and link them to food. So it's a very memoir based writing blog so it was just really just memories with food. And then I would always end it with a recipe and a rubbish photograph. Um, so people kind of think you what it looked like. Um, so that's what started it off. And slowly I realized that rather than blogging once a month, I started blogging once a week because I actually found a lot of satisfaction in putting things out there. But in tandem to me blogging, um, I started very actively on, on social media. So I started things like Twitter and um, I guess Instagram wasn't really the thing at the time, but it, Twitter was, and I really started no idea who to follow, what to do. So obviously I, I follow the usual suspects like Nigella Lawson and Nigel Slater and all these people. Well, Nigel wasn't even there in those days, but I think it was other people. Whoever I could grab, I grabbed. Nobody was interested. Anyway, from there, I just started talking to random people, and uh, I realized that um, that mixture of tweeting your posts and kind of getting your stuff out there started opening up an audience. So I think you can't work away from having a blog and also engaging on social media because that's one of the platforms of getting your word out there. So it's all very well to have a great beautiful blog or a simple blog and have things to say but not engage in social media and get your word out there. Whether someone's listening or not, someone will listen. Someone will want to read. 
So my basic aim is to start the blog was to really educate people, to inspire, to kind of bring people into my kitchen, into my dining table, get a sense of that. And I, my writing has been pretty much very memoir-based, as you can see. Now, I think moving on from there, the, the main thing for me was how do I get people to read what I've written, other than just engaging on social media? What will inspire people to read? I think that the greatest fear that people have when they have a blog is that nobody will ever read what they have to say. Um, and one of the things that I realized about blogging is that you have to not care what people think. I mean, that is my fundamental thing, is I just put stuff out there. Was, I love writing, so I got it out there. But people didn't have to necessarily read it. And I think if you're always hung up about what people's going to read, um, you won't write what's coming from your heart. You won't put things out there. But someone, like I think um, even, even Laura said, that somebody out there, will, it will grab someone's attention. Um, so that's where I started. So if, if I just go back um, to, if you just see, if the main thing is people think that it's visually very nice, but I started my blog off in a, it did, I think one of the main things to me was getting a really good name. So I think if you're going, and I'm going to say this for us food writers, that if you're going to have a blog that resonates your food writing, so if you already have cookbooks and a lot of presence out there, there, there is every reason that you should have a blog. And why I say that's really important for a food writer who already has books and has never written a blog is because you find a way to then suss out what other people want to hear. You get to engage with your fans, your people who buy your book and read your stuff. And um, one of the main things I found when I started writing this blog was a lot of people said, oh, we really love your stories and we really want to see them in a book. And we'd really love to hear more about them. So I obviously created this to look more like a memoir-based cookbook, uh, which gave rise to my cookbook. <laughs> but, um, and so I, I sort of tried to find a story um, that resonated to me for the name. So going right to the beginning, how do you find a title for your blog? Um, I think a blog must have a title that means something to you, so something that inspires your writing and something that inspires your passion to write. Uh, so my Tamron Kitchen wasn't the first name I used. I, I used. I used a name that I think got a lot of attention from people. <laughs> I'm going to go back into time and I'm going to throw it out there. I started off uh, uh, with a um, title um, that kind of invoked a lot of question marks from people. I was called Paka Paki and everyone thought, oh my god, you're calling yourself a Paka. I know it's politically incorrect, but I won so I can call myself that. <laughs> so I, I think one of the main things I did was to grab attention. So the main thing I would say that when you're going to start blogging, find something other than just a beautiful title for your blog, is find a handle that you will use universally through your social media that grabs attention. Um, there are millions of titles out there and every, you, know, you just miss them. But if you get something that's snappy, that makes you raise an eyebrow, or makes you laugh, or makes you cry, or makes you think of your gram, something out there that grabs attention is a great way to get noticed if you're new to the blogging world. And that's how I began. So that stayed with me pretty much throughout. I got a lot of questions on it. I got lots of weird remarks on it. But I also got lots of interest on it. And to me, it meant something. It meant I'm a, a paka means real and pure, and I am a Max Nani. So I thought it kind of like made sense to me because that's what I am. Um, I then slowly moved away from it um, when I started to write more um, for publications and started to get more solid food writing. So I then found a, uh, um, a title that went with the idea I had for my book, which is God Summers Under the Tamarind Tree. So that is what I would say is a very important way to start your blog. Now, everyone, I mean, Laura some said some great points about, you know, the practicalities of blogging. But I think to remain authentic to what you want to put out there. It's really great for people to blog about different cuisines and stuff. I'm a very niche blogger, okay? So I've always blogged about Pakistani food or food around my country and what I grew up with. So if you are going to niche blog, there are a couple of things that I, I would say are very important to um, stay true to. Always write, have a sense of consistency in all your blog posts. So if you're going to write on specifics, so whether it's Italian food or if it's, even say it's about an ingredient or whatever it is that you pick, stay very, um, always write from a place of authenticity and knowledge and genuine, be, be genuine in your posts. Don't just 
sort of, you know, sort of say things, throw away comments without knowing what you're saying, because what you put out there will be in set in stone, and someone will read it, publishers will read it, editors will read it, you know, in magazines, they will, they will know that's, that's what you've said. So I think when you put something out there in the World Wide Web, it's there and it's permanent, unless you take it off. And someone's read it. Ah, oh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, just let me know because I have a tendency of going too close. So, anyway, so then, so the right from the authenticity, um, have a consistent message in all your posts. So that's something we all do as food writers. We're very consistent with what we write because we edit it one million times. So again, going back to what Laura says, even when you blog, make it like you're being paid for it because I think a lot of people are quite lazy with blogging and they think, oh, well, you know, I'm not being, it's just, it's just my, it's just a little blog post, it doesn't matter, but I think it's really important to stay consistent with your style of writing. So if you're a writer for a magazine, if you write articles on a regular basis or columns or books, just make sure that your writing style is consistent um, and it's well edited, self-edited. Um, another thing that I think is really important if you niche blogging, because I can only speak from my experience of blogging in a particular way, is to have a very strong sense of brand. I don't mean going to spend hundreds of pounds on a logo. I got one of my very good friends to design that for me, uh, free. So, um, you know, so really just find something that really speaks and identifies you, because in the, um, the you know, generally in the internet, everyone kind of visually remembers things. So even if you have a really cool name, it won't always be remembered if you don't have a visual impact. So even if it's just your initials or, or something the way you write on a font, it's quite nice to have a visual impact. I mean, we all remember brands and I think it's a really good thing to have there. Um, I'm just going to touch upon this and it might be slightly controversial. A lot of bloggers um, like to look at ways that they can make money from their blogging and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think it's nice to have, to be able to make some money from it. So if you blog about, say, um, particular ingredients or, or produce or restaurants, or you do it you know, for money or whatever reason you do it, just stay consistent to where you started off. So if you've always been blogging about, say, French food and culture and wine and, and you know, tourism, if you start suddenly start endorsing stuff, I know this is just a personal thing, but I just find that people start to lose their integrity quite quickly in blogging. They feel like, ooh, we are suddenly getting famous. Let's take a bit of free freebies here and blog about this particular ingredient and endorse it. I have nothing wrong with people who do that. Lots of people do it, and some people make good money from it. But then stay consistent and be that person. Don't dip in and out saying, oh, I have a bit of this, I have a bit of that. It's nice to have a common message. I'm, very, I'm quite a stickler about that. So I think that it's nice to stay, don't sell out. Stick with what you started off with. So if you want to do a blog that's about ingredients and things that you get paid for, start another blog. So do another parallel blog. It's nice to keep them divided. I think it's quite nice to have a division of what you do. So if you have three different careers, do the three different careers and different blogs. Don't try to mix them up. It confuses people, and I think people don't have the patience for that. Um, if you are going to blog about a particular niche, I think every time you blog something, it's quite nice to use your niche as your filter. So just as you, it's going back to the same thing of staying authentic. It's just stay make you just go step pick, take a step back and say, is your blog post that you're putting out to the world actually what you believe in? Um, so I think that's quite important. Um, I think that I, I find that the most important thing that to me that came about from blogging was the feeling of networking and social interaction with people. So I think that's very important to keep reading other people's blogs. And if you want people to comment on your blog, comment on other people's blogs. So visit lots of blogs, go to those blogs. If you like them, comment on their blogs. Link your blog's name when you comment on it. Make sure you always put your name in. So be attached to things on your social media, but always put your website and your name so the person can go back to your website and maybe comment. And I think a lot of the people I got to know in the blogging world is by going to their blogs and constantly checking them out, writing comments. So it's really nice to keep the blogging community is very friendly with each other. There's a lot of bitchiness, but there's also lots of really nice people out there that I've made great friends. Um, I would say that if you're a food writer, but you want to get to know more about blogging, go to blogging conferences. 
I think they're a really great place to meet people, to learn more about, you know, there's so many different topics they pick up on different blogging conferences, it's great to learn about them. Blogging conferences, you know, they have conferences, so it's quite nice to learn a bit more about how the blogging world works, because it's gone way ahead in the last 10 years from what, you know, we started, and I think it's a, quite a nice thing to have in tandem with a food writing career, because it's, it keeps you busy, it keeps you creatively active. I think if you're not writing a book or you're not doing something in between, it's quite nice to keep your blog going. Uh, to keep your mind and your juices going. Um, I think that I would say that for me, um, personally, when I started blogging, I had always wanted to write a book. I always had, I knew that one day I'm gonna write a book because I loved the aspect of writing. And I pitched to many, many different magazines. And I used to, so I did become a food writer in tandem with my writing and blogging. So I was writing for magazines. I was writing, I was being paid for the work. Um, but I feel that a lot of my blogging did bring work to me. Um, I didn't win any awards or anything, sadly. I never really entered any awards. Um, but what I did was I, I did pitch very hard um, things that I really enjoyed writing about, which was my cuisine, and, and it was hard work. But, um, but because of it, I think because of the writing that I did, my blog did set off. It actually went ahead because of my writing and vice versa. So it's quite nice to do, and I think it's very important to have both in, in this day and age, as a food writer, have a blog. Um, it keeps your voice constant in the food world. And I think that is the main thing these days. It's too much of a fast world. There are too many cookbooks. There are too many good blogs. There are too many visually beautiful blogs that people look at. Because let's face it, we pick up lots of cookbooks that have beautiful visuals in it. So people don't have time. They look, they want to see something. So as much as it's important to write really beautifully on your blog, you don't have to go crazy trying to make your photographs beautiful. I think the story and the impact when you open a blog should be really quite compelling. So title, really important. First thing that I would say about a blog is don't go fancy, go simple. The cleaner, the whiter, the crisper your writing is, the more people read. So if you just, um, and if you could just go not into this one, if you just come down, um, just a, oh, a tiny bit more, please. Mm, if you could just go to the um, bramble aniseed um, pistachio. Thank you. So if you just, if you just look at my daughter's hand there, and they were eaten in 35 seconds. <laughs> and if you just pull down to that, I mean, that was just, I actually took that photograph on my iPhone. I didn't even, I didn't have my camera loaded, there was nothing, so I just took a phone and used my filters and pop it in there. If you just pull it down, please. So, I've written a story about growing up, my grandmother's making those things. I put a picture of my grandmother. So, you know, it's just, just pick up old photographs. Just put in a story if you're gonna do something niche. Even if it's something about travel, pick up beautiful, just one picture of a nice flower or something. Just something that speaks to you. Um, if you just come down all the way, please. So you see, there's mainly just writing and just a recipe. So it's really, really simple. I'm not fancy. Um, and that's my daughter holding the mixture. So you, know, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's really just simple. And those, again, are just photographs from my iPhone. Um, and, and it's all about just being really clean. Just keep it clean. Don't go crazy. Um, so that, I would say, is very important. And I'll just finish off by saying one last thing. So if you're a food writer and you have, this is my blog at the moment, it's going to go into my website, my, no, if, um, Hetty, if you just go to my website, please. So I've basically, since then, I know my blog has got some great comments and I don't want to lose them. I'm actually transferring everything onto sumariyaosmani.com. Uh, I think you might not, if you might have it, if you, have a look, you should have it there somewhere. If you just write it, where Tyburn Kitchen is, if you just write my name, S-U-M-A, it should come up. So if you're going to, if you're going to um, have a really, like, if you have a portfolio of lots of books and great publications, you've written for some fantastic um, uh, publications, so yeah, let's go for that. So this is, my, this is my portfolio now. So what I have done is I've basically linked my blog, if you just go to blog, that's my main website. So there's all the stuff, my events and stuff, and then there's blog. So that, my tavern kitchen is being pulled into here. Right, so you can do things like that. So if you already have an amazing blog and you don't want to get rid of it, pull it into your thing. You can also get web developers to pull your my tavern kitchen. Whenever someone writes that down, they go straight here. So you can get these wonderful things done by web developers. 
But don't get put off by that. Start simple um, and, and, and build on that. And I think that's the main thing. And I would just end by saying, whatever you do, whatever you write, remember that the main thing is always keep a very warm and engaging voice in your writing so that people come back. And I think that's really important. Um, keep it warm, keep it engaging, keep it real and stay true to yourself in your writing. And there is no reason why people would come back to your blog because they like people like to see real people when they read something. So that's really important. Sorry. Thank you. Can we go straight on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Andres. I'm actually, I hate myself because I fall into a stereotype and I sat in a cafe before coming here. And to write some notes on my computer, I'm up. Apologies, but I'm going to read from my computer whilst I do this. Um, I'm not that. I, I'm a blogger. Actually, I think we um, uh, blog is still a word that people spit, I think, rather than say. Um, and me as well. And sometimes I find it quite hard to define myself as a blogger. Um, and I think it's not something to be defined by, but it's something I do, and I'm proud of it, actually. After taking me about six years to be proud of it, but um, I think when I started, I think said that I, well, I, never, I didn't tell anyone to blog for about two years. Um, so uh, I don't really know what you all wanted to hear into the two ladies have always said loads of the comments and the advice that I would and will give already. Um, and so I thought I'd just give a bit of a ramble, uh, which, which hopefully there might be some other things you take out of it. Um, by all means, stop me and ask a specific question for thoughts as well. But what I kind of wanted to cover was how, how I started um, so yeah, um, exactly, I was just a bit too premature, wasn't I? Um, so how and why I started the blog, um, what it is, I'll just we'll show you just quickly um, a few things about it. But then I think maybe some things you might hopefully want to hear is why I continue to do it after six years. Um, how it fits around with other work um, and salary and money and stuff. Um, and then I finish with some, maybe some thoughts about blogging and food writing in 2016 onwards. Um, so I started uh, writing a blog as a creative outlet. I was a corporate lawyer um, at a large firm, um, Fleet Street, and um, uh, I needed a break from regulatory reviews and witness statements and things that were terminally dull. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought I'd start a blog, I'd start reading food blogs and thought, wow, I quite like, it, quite like this. But actually, it was, it was partly a creative outlet, um, but also uh, I worked really hard um, and found that despite loving food, as I think probably we all do here, um, I, wasn't, I was eating at my desk every night of the week. Um, and on a Friday night, I would meet my friends at Pizza Express or some awful place um, and wish that the, the restaurant news that I read the next day and told everyone about, I wish that I'd organised myself to go to those places. So I wanted to make myself eat out once a week and I wanted to also ensure that I uh, cooked something new once a week. So I sort of basically started having weekend cooking projects. And the blog was, as someone who needs sort of to compartmentalise my life, um, was a way of making me do those things. So it's sort of by saying I'm going to write something about it, I was making myself, making myself fulfill those promises. And that really is, that's why I did it, and I think if there is a learning point <coughs> at all, I think um, if you ever, uh, if you ever go into wanting to do a blog because you want to create a new platform for yourself or to make money directly out of it, you probably will fail. Um, I hope you fail. Because <laughs> I, think, I think that these sort of things, in, in the best ones are very personal. And um, you should stick to it. The only reason I continue to do it is because it's a personal project. Um, so that, that's why I started, and that's why I at least tell myself why I continue to do it. Um, so the blog itself um, is kind of, this is version 2.0, I suppose. Uh, version 3.0 is probably due. This is about three years old when we, when we did this, um, three years ago. So I started uh, to finish that long winded story. Started in about June 2010. Um, and ended up leaving my job when I realised that uh, uh, when I was getting home at midnight and spending two or three hours writing a blog post, that maybe it was something I enjoyed a bit more than, um, uh, than law. 
Um, and also, I actually told everyone, if, if you ever see me trying to become a food writer, then stop me, because um, <clears throat> I just I thought I was going to be like the next Byron Burger or something with loads of money, and then I realized that actually I much prefer writing and meeting interesting people than trying to take money from people. Um, so yeah, there are about three sort of parts of the blog. There's um, eating in, if you want to click on that, I think you should at the top, um, which uh, is recipes to eat in. Um, the, yeah, you're going to maybe scroll to the bottom um, and then just scroll back up. So, it's quite a lot of stuff there, but actually you'll see that I think I now only probably post about two recipes a month. Um, and usually they are things that I've done for other platforms. Um, unless, yeah, because I just don't have got a lot of time. Um, if you go to the top, then uh, the work section is eating out. So that's the restaurant that I wanted to go to. Um, you'll see that a few pictures. When, when I first started, um, in 2010, that was a kind of peak restaurant blog period, um, and for sure I wanted to kind of go to new places. Um, I, there are lots of pictures there, but um, my general theme is to not, until recently when I'm now addicted to Instagram, to not um, take many pictures in restaurants, because generally pictures are pretty awful in restaurants. And um, I found myself drawing, doodling, uh, the get the out sort of sides of places instead. So that's been my thing. So you could go down there, there might be a picture in there, in and amongst it, but I've always wanted it to be about writing, actually, sort of misguided thinking that people would read it. Um, uh, yeah, so there's stuff on restaurants, and at the bottom I always have a. Oh, if you just scroll up a bit, sorry. Uh, I always started from the very beginning saying if I could review or mention a place and describe it in three words, that kind of became a thing, um, which sometimes is quite nice to have um, to keep yourself occupied. And then the last bit is uh, a section that says noted. So when I first started, it was about the restaurants I enjoyed, uh, the place I enjoyed going to, the food that I cooked, and just other things about food that I found interesting in the same way as you. It's very quick to just put a list of stuff. But accidentally, this turned into a thing called supplemental, um, which is the bane of my life. And um, I, every Monday, I publish, every Monday more or less, I publish a digest of recipes in the weekend papers. Um, and it's, excuse my French, but a complete ball egg. Um, and, uh, however, as I'll talk about it, it's been kind of something that's um, helped probably get me my blog to have a bit more profile to me as a, as a writer to get more work. Um, so that's, that's the blog, and so why do I continue to blog six years into it? I probably do every two months say I might give it three more months and then stop. Um, it kind of, you know, it caused me to leave a perfectly good job. Um, it in many ways has been the thing that's actually stopped me from once I left that job to jump in feet first and start a business like I intended to do because there have always been opportunities that have arisen from having a blog that is frankly a bit nicer than bringing nothing down and, um, and starting something and, and leaving in. But it's also quite good been my platform. Um, it's given me some amazing opportunities. Uh, last year I had like eight, eight weeks worth of um, cookery columns in the weekend papers. I had various other things. I'm currently finished a cookbook and categorically none of these things would ever have happened if I wasn't rocket and squash. Um, but actually, uh, it's also deeply personal. I mean, there's, a, there's a food blogger called Helen Gray, who has a blog called Food Stories, which is probably the blog I enjoyed the most and still enjoy um, reading when I first started in 2010 and, and now still. She's been doing it for like nine or ten years, um, and her kind of output has dropped off notably in the last year or two. And I had lunch with her a few weeks ago, and I was like, you know, so you kind of winding it down and she said actually she did think about that um, it's a really long time to run a person like that and so she really slowed down her output and then she said that around Christmas she realised that it was actually part of her to become you know it's more than a hobby it's something that she uh, identifies with it's why it's almost like a raisin betcher and so she's doing a bit more of it again um, and I think it would probably be the same with me I do keep thinking I'll stop but um, I don't quite know how I'll do that at the moment um, so, which goes to sort of how does blogging um, regularly 
fit around at the work, I, I probably, because of supplemental, spend between five to ten hours a week doing stuff on my blog. Um, because sometimes it's more actually, and I do some monthly newsletters and computers take time and photographs to process and things really add up and that's not even taking into account what I'm writing about. You know, if, it, if, I choice, if I treated it as a job, then for another couple of hours of going to a producer or, or doing something before you even start writing it. So um, if I was really smart, I wouldn't be doing that. I'd be doing, spending the same effort on something that got paid for. And my blog doesn't generate any money directly, but in the same way as Samaya said, I think um, there's a film social network about Facebook. And um, there's a quote in that saying advertising isn't cool. And it's not, you know, it's, I think, immediately use integrity. Um, and for yourself, it's it immediately, if you start writing, because someone wants you to promote their product, you know, <clears throat> it's a lot harder to do when it's your personal platform than if you're copywriting for a magazine. Um, that said, uh, I, I'm fully aware that the reason why I've been getting work as a food writer is because of my platform as a blogger. Um, the platform is not just a blog, it's definitely social media as well, and increasingly that crosses over with paid work. Um, I think there are some indirect things you can get a blog, but again, I, I don't think it's ever worth starting a blog because you want to get paid for it. Um, and also there's other benefits of just being invited to press things that you don't have to pitch to get a commission for to make it worth while you're going, and then that can then lead on to other thoughts and ways to pitch for that indirect stuff. Um, so that's kind of why I still why I still do it, and I do, as I said, almost every week, uh, one thing on supplemental. Every other week now, probably in a restaurant. I don't like to call them a review because I'm not a paid critic, and so it's an account of my time at a restaurant. And then two recipes a month, probably, although increasingly they are simply copy and paste jobs uh, from Borough Market or something else that I've done. Um, so blogs and food writing in 2016, um, I have to say I think that blogging, writing blogs, food blogs, it has, I think it's peaked in terms of its influence on third parties. Um, when I started in the year 2010, there were people who were getting a lot of book deals uh, at that point, simply because of their blog, not necessarily, but I think the publishers probably thought they must give a food blogger a, a cookery book because someone in America or Australia was doing that and they thought it was a big, good business opportunity. Um, I think that uh, that probably won't happen now unless you've got a really good pitch or a, a memoir or a story to tell. Um, restaurant PRs were falling over themselves to give restaurant bloggers access to restaurants, free food, and frankly, uh, if they ever had an influence five years ago, it doesn't now in terms of bloggers, the conversation has moved to social media um, and uh, people get famous or, uh, well, well that's not the right word, but um, infamous for having Instagram accounts and have influence in that way and so if any of you, and I don't think any of you here as professional food writers are intending to start a blog to be a restaurant, to get free restaurant stuff, um, I wouldn't bother if you were. Um, but, So, why? I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. once again in Washington restaurants, which I don't like. Yeah. Um, why that doesn't work? Um, so, um, just a bit away. Okay. A bit away, okay. Um, in 2010, yeah. there were many, in 2012 probably, um, PR, restaurant PRs, and journalists and editors were afraid of the internet and the effect that people could have by simply starting a blog. And, and that's why the word blog is spat, because people who were journalists were all, you know, what, what will happen? Yeah, and just you know, how it is. suddenly you have access, anyone can write anything on the internet, and so people thought that that was important. Um, I think now there's been a slight reversion to the classic journalism and importance of that. I think that there are other social media forms that are more influential. And as a result, I don't think that simply starting a blog is a way to become infamous or to get a platform. However, as I said, I still continue to do my blog because I want to do it, and it's a personal thing. But perhaps more importantly, I think that 
um, the state of food writing is, is in its sort of in flux at the moment, and it's if you look at what that what we were able to write, it's actually quite disappointing because most of the mediums that we write for don't think that people want to read anything longer than seven hundred words. You know, this having a blog is the opportunity to write a thing that you will never get a commission for. And you know, as, as a and the two benefits that one is that the active the activity of writing of writing and practicing is is what we enjoy. And having your own blog, whether anybody reads it, you are able to write something what you should edit. That you don't necessarily have to have a workout. And so I write stuff on my blog because no one else is going to pay me to write that for them. Um, it also acts as a repository for your work and a CV point, which everyone knows that if you do want to email someone and say, we haven't met before, here's an example of my work, this is the modern way of having it there. So I think there's real value in having a blog where you've already got one or start one for those two reasons. And um, that sort of then links into people say, how often should you blog? I always get really annoyed when I read things that say, oh, I'm so sorry I haven't blogged for a while. I mean, and it's like, it doesn't matter, it's your personal thing. And, um, and you, if you are making yourself right because you think that your mum wants to read it more regularly. I mean, actually, I'm an emotional retard, and my mum has, has learned a hell of a lot more because I seem to write it. Um, than I've, I've never spoken to her about anything. Uh, and so she, she really knows a lot more about me now. I think she'd be the most, she wouldn't be the categorically most upset person if I stopped writing it because she'd stop learning anything about me. Um, uh, I think. I think those are, those are my sort of key things in terms of I do think it should just be a personal thing with no other agenda than to be able to write what you want and have maybe someone read it but really practice to you know, have access to, to put something out there and enjoy it, um, not to be beholden to it and not to think that you need to do anything other than create a, something for you to write on. It is a bit like a diary. Um, and you know, I would never have thought I'd be writing a diary and certainly not that I'd be publishing my thoughts to, to people, but it's, it's quite nice. Um, other just general kind of uh, things that dawned me when you two were speaking. Um, the. Uh, <laughs> they didn't dawn me that well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it might come back to me, but I mean, that's, that was my ramble about why I continue to blog, and hopefully there's some, some things in there that maybe you disagree with or agree with, um, which is fine, because I think that, that's the thing, is that you can't really have rules or guidance, because everything is contradictory. So, for example, I say that I think you should be beholden to blogging, but every, every fucking Sunday I write, I read every single paper and I write down all the rest of it is because I think I should. So everything is, you know, contradicts yourself, but, um, you know, there's no... You can have a plain blog that people appreciate because you're writing it because it's your platform, or you can have one that you wanted to make look really nice because people have grabbed their attention. I don't think necessarily there's a wrong or a right way to do it. It just comes down to you. Um, yeah, that's about what I thought I'd say. Thank you very much. I know it's difficult when the questions are coming this way, so if people can say the question, then if it hasn't been heard, I might try and give a quick reprise of the question before throwing it out to one, two, or three, or anyone specific that you wanted to answer the question for you. So, I have a general question for the panel, which might fulfil your brief. Yes. <laughs> um, the first one is, um, with such sophisticated and impressive blogs, as I've seen um, here today or tonight, um, do you actually think that therefore one needs a website? That's the first thing, because a lot of them, you know, some of them are, well, all of them are set up as sort of like mini websites in a very personal way, which is, which is great. And the second question is um, if you post recipes online, are you not worried about the copyright aspects of that, that they'll be pinched or just slightly changed and reused? 
other people's um, uh, work. Did you all hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, no, no. Okay, so the question is sort of two, two, two part question. Um, the first part is whether or not uh, people should think about having a website and a blog, and how those two things might work together. No, no, no. No, it's not. How okay. It is. okay, okay. Whether one should or shouldn't have a website and a blog. And then the second part is about copyright and putting recipes out there in the world wide web, and, web, and then other people maybe deciding to borrow them inappropriately. Um, Laura, do you want to take a note? Um, I think if you have a website or a blog, it's your, it's your call. Um, I mean, Sumaya, what she showed us, the way the blog is a drop-down tab on her website, I mean, that's, it's brilliant. And it showcases the other things she does beside writing, like teaching or speaking and things like that. So it, I think it's your call. There's, it's not, there's no rule. It's kind of, I think it's, it's semantics. It's semantics, really, because you know, a blog is something that you've logged on the web. Like that's, that's all it is, and, and, and I think the technical term is it's just, just a page or a website that gets frequently updated. And if the blog is within a website, if it looks like a website, if it's a classic blog site, I don't think it makes you know, a difference, personally. Yeah, I would disagree with that. I mean, my, my blog integrated into my website's a new thing. I've obviously always had the blog there, and I always had my cookery classes advertised there as well. I've put, put them together on the portfolio page. Now, what I find really nice about having a website as a portfolio which speaks about your work, as in your writing, your cookery teaching, or whatever else you may do, um, is that it keeps an engaging voice there. So what I found is ever since I've got that, I've got tons of comments. Oh, we read your Guardian residency. It was brilliant. We love your recipes. Can you post more of these type of recipes? It's a really nice engaging platform. So I've had people come back to my website because it was advertised in the Guardian with my, at the end of the residency. And then they said, well, they came to my blog. So instead of sending me an email or finding me on social media, it was another way of finding a recipe saying, wow, we love this recipe as well great to see that you're posting fresh recipes. So that's one thing. And I'll, I'll carry, if that's, carry on about the copyright thing. So I think there was a wonderful copyright uh, issue um, talk that we once had for the Guild, which was really helpful. And it's actually cleared my mind up about a lot of these issues. The fact is, if you write recipes anyway, whether they're published on your blog or in magazines or in books, you're always open to that copying angle. Uh, so there's always that, you're always, when you put a recipe out there, whether it's on a website, on paper, in a magazine, you'll always be at the risk of people copying one. So it doesn't matter which platforms it at, it's at. What I, I would recommend is pick and choose the recipes that you put out. Be really smart about the recipes you put out there. So if you've got book 3, 4, 10, 15, 20 in your head, don't put the recipes that you hope to put in those books on your blog. Put the ones that people generally like to go to to find. So it's nice to kind of Google sometimes and see what are things like people like to see. So chili con carne, people love good recipes for chili con carne. They love good recipes for what to do with like halibut or something. You know, something, something that people like. So put those recipes out. The things that you're not afraid of getting copied. That's hard because when they're your work, it's always you're always scared. But just be clever about what you put out there. I've got a thing on mine with the Creative Commons license, which it's all words, it doesn't mean anything, it just means please don't take this without crediting me. I, people are going to do what they want. If you put my blog up, Heidi, I'll show you can see, um, I just did it out of principle. But it's the same, yeah, I put it out there, but people are going to take it. It's, I'd consider, I'd be flattered if someone took one of my recipes. I mean, I put them up there because that's what they want. But if you scroll here, yeah, so keep going. That, so, see, this work is licensed. Right? And so all you have to do is go on the Creative Commons website and they will give you that little, you can do it whatever size suits best. It's more like just saying to the world, please, please respect my work and if you do borrow it, just say where you got it from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people do acknowledge it and some people don't. Yeah. And I think, I think one of those things is that, you know, if you put your recipes out there, just like, like Rose said, just that people copy it. You know, just don't, like I said, just be smart about what you want to put out there. Don't put out stuff that you want to write to make money from. Even if you do, just be careful about how you do it. And I think those little, those things that help you get the, um, the copyright stuff, it doesn't mean anything because people can just copy and paste. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. No, I've got nothing else. Sure? <laughs> I think there's an essential difference 
even a philosophical difference between a website and a blog. A blog is essentially, fundamentally, a diary. It is therefore essentially personality oriented. The person who is writing it is the central feature of it. A website is, in two senses, websites are history. They're history in the sense that people are not paying all that much attention to them as such anymore. But they are also history because they contain history. My, I set up my first website oh, 25 years ago or so. It's still there, it's accumulated, and things that I put up are still there. I find when I go searching for information, blogging, and put in subject matter, what comes up that is most useful is contained in websites. Fairly rarely does a blog come up which contains information of the sort that, uh, that I'm looking for. Uh, so far as, uh, well, one, one of my websites, I started reviewing Paris bistros when I was traveling to Paris a lot. It has accumulated over the years well over a hundred extensive reviews. They are not up to date in the sense that you could take them as guides of where to go, but they are history. They are, in many cases, places, wonderful places that no longer exist. So far as I have been able to, or have the time, I've identified those places that are no longer there. But I have, I forgot the name of the program, which tells you who is coming to your website and what they're looking at. My, my old Paris Bistro's reviews are still getting constant hits from people who, who, want to, uh, uh, who, who want to know about what happened then. And of course, what has happened to the food scene in Paris, it, it, as it, it has become history as it was. It's not what it was. Well, I don't want to go on and on. But I, don't, I wanted to emphasize this difference between uh, 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 online information as, as, in, as information and online personality projection, which are two very different things. Actually, before we go too much further, I should ask this at the beginning. Can you put your hands up? Who has a blog? Wow, okay. <laughs> So we have a lot, a lot of experienced people experience out there. Experience. Oh, just, no, 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 just started. Okay. All right. And who has a website? Okay. Oh, who has a website? I have four of them. <laughs> okay. And that's really interesting. Okay. I have a YouTube channel. You have a YouTube channel. Okay. John has a YouTube channel. You're a blogger. You're a blogger. Blogger. Not even that, but I mean, uh, yes. That's. Uh, who else has a YouTube channel? That's what we're talking about. Yeah. A couple of YouTube channels. Oh, you've got one. Ed has a YouTube oh, channel. Three, four things on Any more questions? Who's got a question? Oh, lots of questions. Do you want a microphone? <coughs> um, slightly flippant question. Do successful bloggers such as yourselves obsessively check the number of views you get? <laughs> and at what number did you kind of think, oh, this is going somewhere, this is kind of taking off, and it, and it did somehow take off? Um, I don't anymore. I, I did, there were various points, the sort of, I think, you know, the first six months of running my blog and sitting in my office, I'd sort of sneak onto Google Analytics and see you know, eight people or um, something and then when it became 15 I was like wow you know, this is really going somewhere um, and then I probably forgot about that for a year or two and then when people start asking they sort of get in touch with you and they say how many unique hits do you have and then you start paying attention again but I, I, again I think it, for me it became something that uh, I probably look at once every three or four months and um, because it didn't change. <laughs> I, and because, because I, feel, I fundamentally believe that I'm writing it as a personal project, not because I want 
it's fantastic that people read it, um, but I've not, I've got absolutely no interest in seeing which of my blog posts are more interesting to other people because they're my blog posts. But I think I'm probably completely anti to anything you'll ever learn in a, in a, in a website, in a, you know, a, a seminar teaching you how to blog, which will tell you to put a new post up every day and to link it on every single channel that you have at XYZ. But I just think that in the long run, if you, if you do something you believe in and you're good at it, it will get recognition. And if, if you aim to, be, to follow the system and to count numbers, then it wouldn't be the world's most depressing uh, situation. I just only found that first year with you. Um, I would resonate with that. I mean, I don't ever look at how many people have looked at my blog posts. I did initially as well, look now and then. And it was quite interesting initially because what it did was give me a sense of what people are interested in. So in that way, it did help. So, you know, there were certain posts that got zero hits and certain would get some more. And so I knew what people were looking for. But they, so, might, be, they, might, have come to, they might have been interested purely because you were better, more effective at linking to it on social maybe, media. Maybe, yeah. The content of it, they might then disappear straight away. I think so. It just, you just don't know where it's coming from, whether it's coming because they're looking for something or they've found something. So I stopped obsessing over it because I thought it was just unhealthy and it was exact. It's just a personal project. It was about getting my voice out there and that's all I ever use it for. And I really never look at uh, Google Analytics. And sometimes I look and I'm like, Oh yeah, right, I do have that on there, but I really don't care much for it. Sometimes. I don't anymore because I, the blog is dormant at the moment, although I like Ed's idea of I'm going to start putting my borough stuff on there. I never dawned on me to do that. That's just completely stupid on my part. I should. Um, yeah, in, in the beginning I did, now I don't. If you blog on WordPress, WordPress has a thing called site stats. Super easy to check. So, yeah, but it is that thing, it's like, what does it mean? I don't know, it means that someone beside my mom is reading it. And it does feel nice, you know, it's recognition, isn't it? Um, but you don't know what it means, that's the thing, you know, what are they responding to? So, I think it's fun, but don't get caught up in it. The microphone just behind you. I just like to ask two questions, if I may. First one. Is telling your followers about how much it matters, how successful you are. Because I have a blog on Tumblr, and Tumblr is completely different from WordPress. And I would like to move it to WordPress because WordPress is more stylish, it's more serious. Uh, because I think the people reading my blog on Tumblr are a very young age group from 18 to 25, and they are it's very much their of the pictures, but there's a huge number of them. I'm worried if I move it to WordPress, I will not take them with me. I've got to close one of them down, presumably. That's the first question. Um, and the second one is... Could you just hold the microphone just slightly? Like Sorry. Side? And so my was talking about making it personal. Well, my blog is very personal, but I'm very nervous of actually putting in photographs of children or grandchildren. And so I have a crazy system referring to them as son number one, two, three, or four, or grandson or daughter number eight, nine, or six. And so I don't ever put photographs in. Do you think that's a mistake? Would it be better if I actually put the beautiful little kiddies in? I don't know. Did everybody hear that question? Can you repeat it? Yes, or which? Who wants to do it? I think it's Maya, because you've got pictures of your darlings. Um, yes, I know. Um, I did have a concern about that initially. Um, I got over it because I thought that there's Facebook and there's everything else there and I have to then basically stop putting things anywhere because let's face it, nothing is private at the moment with um, the internet. So I felt, because I had a very personal story to tell, very limited pictures, that's probably the only post where my daughter is really there. Um, I've got a couple of family photographs and things like that, um, but they're in my book as well. So I felt that um, it was nice to keep that personal touch because it keeps people connected, but maybe not go wild and put pictures of her doing this and that. It was just one, one off. Um, it's nice to give a personal touch because, again, going to the visual angle, um, it's, it kind of gets people to feel um, and feel connected. So I think you need to think about it because she's my daughter. I guess if she was a grandchild, I would probably think a few times because I'd have you know, my daughter-in-law, my son-in-law to deal with, and it, it gets all very political. So I think I, it, you just have to make that judgment call and probably keep it quite limited. Ed, can you address the Tumblr question? 
uh, uh, Tumblr question is, um, as I said, my, my brother is the, the whiz behind what I do. So um, all I know is that certainly people often migrate to, to WordPress. And I think WordPress has become known as being good at what it does, but also capturing the website information from other websites. I would hope that they're quite good at nicking stuff from Tumblr adequately so that you, that you don't lose out. But I, I can't give you a... Yeah, I think it, it is sort of, it, it's, it's a good platform. It, why do you want to move it? Um, if you've got a good audience and it's working on Tumblr, why would you mess with it? Um, you could always start a WordPress blog. Mm. You can just add another blog if you want, but I mean, if it's working, and your audience is 18 to 25, I'd leave it there. Could, could, you, could you duplicate it? Because if people read really Tumblr, I don't think I want to duplicate it, but you may be right, I should start something else. Who else? Let's grab the mic. Hello. Um, first, thank you so much. It's so interesting. <laughs> and um, a question for Laura. Do you think that there's a difference between UK and US blogs, do you think there's a difference in the audience? And yes, are US people reading UK blogs looking for interesting things, and does that have been vice versa? I don't think I can speak for the entire nation. <laughs> um, and I have actually lived more of my life in this country than in the US, even though that doesn't sound like it. Um, so it's a difficult one. There certainly are more food blogs in the US. There's a lot of them, and they're very different. Um, and so I think that's a good question in the sense that you need to think about what market you're, who are you blogging to? Um, you know, if you, I think there's, there's a different feel to UK blogs um, than US blogs, but I would say that about books as well. I mean, I've always found American cookery books very different than UK cookery books. You can tell before you even know whose name is on it, at least I can, whether it's UK or US. So I think there's just an inherent difference in, in the way subjects are. So, I, you know, How why, do, why, why do you, would you rather have a US audience get more people, just because there's physically more people there? I, I work a lot in the US, probably more in the US than in the UK, so I was just wondering how they are different. Um, yeah. So I, I go for Facebook. No, I know the obvious <laughs> measures of this in terms of the first band of content. Yeah, so I know. Yeah, I go for phases of reading blogs around the world and in Britain, and what I always notice with American ones is that many of them are incredibly professional, um, huge numbers of styled photos, and actually, actually huge amounts of content. Like I said, that you can write whatever you want. Editing is really important, and American blogs often go on and on and on and on and on, and on, and on. <laughs> um, which maybe is that's what their audience wants. Um, but also, they also happen to be professional men who are like categorically successful financial businesses because. The American audience is just so much bigger than our own, and as a result, they can put more time and money and styling and everything else in. And I think that's the big difference: is that again, why five years ago publishers thought, you know, wow, blogs are going to be really big, and we should jump on the back of them, is because American blogs have got, you know, even the San Francisco blog has got probably more potential viewers than a British-based blog, let alone when it goes beyond that state. So it's just, I think they're more professional. Yeah, I think that's fair. But just to ask you another question, I mean, has anyone said you need to blog more for the US market or is it something you want to do? Well, I have, I have more market than US, which is why I was asking. It's a tricky one because I think what we've all three consistently said without checking with one another is be true to yourself and find your own voice. And if that's working and getting you work there, stick with yeah, it. There is no other way. I was just, I was just interested. Mm. You know, I'm not planning to alter my personality. Mm. Um, but it was really to understand if there was a difference. And, um, you know, obviously I've perceived my own differences, but I wondered if that was something that everybody concurred with or if it was my personal perception. But I have noticed, and, and, and you know, I think one of the reasons why I've never done a blog is. Because 
they, they, people seem to post on a daily basis and a lot of content, and that's a magazine. Like, well, <laughs> but that, that comes back to it being, it comes back to it, it's, it's, it's not, it's a business for most of the people that you'll actually read and be aware of in America, is that, and that's why they post every day, because they really do need to care about the stats, and they do need to make sure that their advertisers, who they almost certainly have on their website, get the, get the numbers up. I mean, I, I agree with one thing, is that American blogs are very shiny, happy, big, in your face, like everything in America is, and it's cultural, and I think the way that the blogs are in America, I mean, they're lovely, they're gorgeous, so I'm not saying anything negative, but it's the culture of America, it's how it needs to look, it's a big marketing culture, it's a big PR culture, so it's all very visually PR'd in a way, so I think that's very different from UK blogs, which I feel a little bit more real, a little bit more personal, not saying that American blogs aren't personal, but it's always, it always feels like it's a veil of, of uh, perfection. You know, and I think that in, in England and in the UK generally, you just see blogs being a little bit more, even when they're visually very beautiful, there's a little bit more, you're able to touch them, a little more attainable. So there is, and that I think is just a cultural thing. Thank you. We are starting to run out of time. Um, so I think we can just take maybe two more questions here, and then we'll be having a good sort of clearing up and having a quick glass of wine, so you might be able to ask the guys things more individually then. The two ladies down here, you've been dying to ask questions. Thank you. Well, first of all, just to say thank you, because I know blogging is a labor of love, and all of that hard work is really appreciated. I particularly like the, well, everything, but the, the cassettes that you do and which is so time consuming are, are hugely helpful. And the memoirs and the essays, uh, I, love, I love the candor that you bring to your writing, and I uh, particularly like the essay on you know, the myth of that Can I just swap? Um, I'm looking that one's working. No. Oh. Thank you. I, I did have a, a sort of practical question about the commercial and the, and the personal integrity. Um, my blog has absolutely no commercial aspects to it at all. And I do it um, because I, I want to be completely free of all of that. Um, but I've lately been contacted by companies who want to um, link to a recipe and use an image, and uh, they haven't asked for anything in return. So I thought that that was probably not inconsistent with, with what I'm doing. But I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that kind of boundary. So they want to use link directly to what you've already done. Yeah, they have they have a sort of recipe of the month thing on an on, on, online journal, and they liked the image probably because it was in the right palette for the clothing they were selling. Um, for that Are they sale. offering you money or credit? No, nothing. Well, credit, yes. They're going to say I am on their site. They're going to identify me. So they're giving me credit for the recipe, but they have not asked me to put anything about them on my blog. Can, so it is Can I just say that Laura was one of the runners up in the Guild of Food Writers blogging entries last year. So she's got a, a, an award nominated blog, and it's really lovely. You shall have a look. <laughs> okay. um, well, I mean, I think we probably all would say don't work for free, but I think, I think that what you're personally you know, what you're being asked for is slightly different to being either asked to create content on your blog or for it to be put into print and used as in the original material. It sounds like they're simply linking to your blog, <laughs> maybe replicating it, which the classic, the, the, the traditional way of growing a blog is to either comment on someone else's or to have other people link to it, because frankly, how else will they find it? If you're comfortable that that's what they're doing, it sometimes can be great, but it's not a bad way of building a profile. If it, it seems like they're simply just taking your work and using that in the way that they ought to pay you for, then say, would you pay for that? If not, then no thanks very much. Well, I'm used to not being paid for 
I think sometimes I get really strange requests um, for content things that, you know, we can use your stuff and we're going to give you a blog post to put on yours. I don't do those kind of things. But I have had sometimes people contact me and say, um, we really like this recipe, we want to be doing the 10 best of something, can we use yours? Um, and I have allowed it because I think what it does is it does create readership and viewership. So it does put you out there, like I said, it's the old fashioned way of getting out there. Um, and so. Just, you know, if it's like for me, you know, I don't know, a gardening company said, we'd like to use your recipe, and I'm like, I'll be a little bit suspicious as to why, but if it's something that links with food and or something about the topic that you write about, I think it can't go wrong if they're going to credit you. <coughs> Thank you. I think one more. Can you use this one, because I'm thinking that one's working. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I started a blog at the end of last year, and I found a lot of online help through um, a very good Facebook group, Food Blogger Central, and they've been really, really good at helping, but it is very American-centric. Most of the bloggers on it are American bloggers, and I just wondered, um, I've got a very low social network profile at the moment, how do I build that up, and are there any other good UK Facebook groups or people that you can network with that might be able to help that come from our perspective slightly more? I don't have any, I don't really link up with anything like that. I have to say that all my engagement has been on Twitter with a lot of different bloggers and that's helped and I've you know, spoken to them. I'm not a part of any kind of Facebook page or anything like that, but it is really helpful if you find something like that that's centric to our writing style. Um, but I think that if you find like-minded people on a social network, be it Instagram or Twitter, for me that's always worked, but that's just a personal thing. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything else. But that's always been my way of growing a network. I think um, Twitter and increasingly Instagram would be my kind of social network. Um, I think there's a thing called Food Blogger Connect, um, which I think probably is an American thing, but also has... No, it's, it, she does it in the UK. Okay, yeah, no, I know it's in the UK, I didn't know where it started at the origin. Okay, but, um, but they, I think, you mentioned conferences, yes, and they, they have a conference, and I think that in terms of a more of a classic physical meetup or a, a group of people who are wanting to, to network and share and to encourage each other. No response from them. Oh, right. I wondered whether they even existed anymore. Um, they are, they're supposed to do one this year, but they haven't got a venue yet, so they are going to sort of add. Okay. Twitter. Yeah, I think um, you just have to, I mean, both. Yeah, you have to be really persistent, and it's quite boring sometimes. <laughs> um, but, you, yeah, I think Twitter's a good way of doing it. Um, and that's not necessarily the same thing as a Facebook page where you connect with people and ask questions. But if you're finding it's not kind of doing what you want it to do, then maybe you need to branch out and try some of the other um, platforms. And Twitter's good. Pinterest is Pinterest isn't great for cookery because I think a lot of it's really shoddy. But that's personal. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, Instagram is good too. So you know maybe what you need to do is spread yourself across more platforms. Building up your followers. I think I've got about 40 followers on Instagram, so I'm not reaching many people. Sumaya, the expert. Oh, just, I'm not an expert. Um, I think it's just a matter of um, the best way to do it is to um, follow loads of people, then go into their followers and their following. Follow all the ones that sound slightly. Just go crazy following people, and soon you will weed out the weeds <laughs> because you will know the ones that don't make any sense to you to follow and that then allows people follow you back and I think people follow on Instagram a lot faster than they do on Twitter it's because the Twitter feed gets a bit too intense um, depending on the kind of people you're following so sometimes visually it's quite nice so you can just like say oh I don't like the photograph I'll just unfollow them but sometimes visually interesting Instagram things can really capture and if you post nice things it doesn't have to always be pretty food it can be nice things just pretty sceneries or and that engages people and you write something lovely just a little bit and if you just go and follow people follow their followers follow their following you will get slowly and slowly start building up and that's really how I did it and I don't have that many followers um, but you know it's a good way. <laughs> I think we need to wrap it up. Um, we can be here for 10 minutes or so more, so please have some wine, have some of the Canada Cannon, Marcus, Shaggy Tree. 
um, talk to the guys, um, but really, Laura, Ed, Maya, thank you, thank you so much. Can I add something that I just thought of, which could be very useful? If you write something on a subject that you think is really remarkably good and definitive, and uh, there is a uh, uh, and there's a Wikipedia article of that subject, I have gone in and added in the external links things that I have written, yeah. and they have not been removed because yes. the editors have thought that was worth staying there. Is that that is that you